Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, really delighted uh, to present to you the next uh, episode in the Xeno Talks uh, series for ESOT. Um, with me this evening is a real, real privilege because uh, this man has been my big inspiration in my career and my mentor, Professor David Cooper uh, from Boston in the US. Um, can you perhaps uh, introduce yourself, uh, David? For the audience, yes, uh, I've uh, I trained in Britain, uh, in London, and uh, did my uh, general surgery training in Cambridge, and uh, then cardiac surgery training, and then I went to work with Professor Chris Barnard in Cape Town, who carried out the first heart transplant some years before, and I spent a few years with him, and then I was recruited to come over to the United States to, to help run a program here, and uh, after some years, I decided to. Uh, quit the clinical work after 17 years in heart transplantation uh, to devote myself to xenotransplantation, which had become my major research interest. And so uh, the last several years, I've been working entirely into translational research into xenotransplantation and have been pleased to see it's now just beginning to get into the clinic, uh, which has been obviously the aim. Um, and at the present time, I'm at the Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and the uh, Center for Transplantation Sciences uh, here. Thank you. I mean, um, it's really special to be back after 20 years uh, when we started working together, at least I joined you in the lab uh, with David Sachs at the Transplant Biology Research Center and the MGH. And this is now more than 20 years ago, actually. We were really excited when we, we had the first availability of the GALT knockout pigs and we did the first uh, transplants from, from pigs to baboons from these knockout pigs. And uh, we got this, well, actually consistent three to sometimes six months uh, graft survival without any hyperacute rejection and no specific prophylactic treatment to prevent this. This was, I think, the other special thing. And we did feel at that time that something really big was happening. Um, but it took, again, 20 years before the first clinical xenotransplants were, were performed. Um, so I would be very, very interested to hear um, and also to, to let the transplant community, the ESOT community hear from your lifetime experience, basically, in xenotransplant research uh, about the long and winding road to come to clinical application. So can you perhaps share, um, how did you get interested in xenotransplantation? Uh, well, uh, I was, part of the team at Papworth Hospital in Cambridge, where we started the heart transplant program there. Um, and I realized that immediately and, and, and soon after when I, <clears throat> when I joined the staff at the Hrutsku uh, Hospital in Cape Town, um, I realized the biggest problem was obtaining donor organs, um, even though the results of the transplants were not very great at that time, the, the biggest problem was finding an organ for somebody. So when I got to Cape Town, where we had a very good research laboratory, uh, and we had baboons available to us as, as a, as a uh, experimental model. Uh, they cost us $25 each there because they were caught on the farms and instead of eating the crops, they were brought in to be, uh, to, they would either be shot or they would be given to us. I might point out that now it cost me nearly $10,000 per, per baboon. And in those days it was $25. Um, and so I realized we had the opportunity <clears throat> to look at cross-species transplantation. So I started looking at monkey to baboon and then realized that that wasn't going to solve the problem because of the size of the baboons or the monkeys, the, size, the, the breeding capacity and so on and so on. So in 1985, I think it was, I started looking at the peak to baboon. And I think that was the first group uh, that uh, looked at that model. And of course, rejection occurred within a few minutes in most cases. Um, and nobody had really thought much about um, uh, genetic engineering at the time. Um, but we did some initial work. We identified GAL as the major target for an human antibodies and so on and so on. And then when I left there and came over to the States, uh, I continued that work. And when you were with, with us in, uh, in Boston, um, that's when we had the first what I think the major breakthrough when we had the gal knockout peaks. 
previous to that, um, David White in Cambridge in the United, United Kingdom had, had come up with the first genetically modified pigs, which had expressed the complement regulatory protein CD55. So that was the first pigs. step. So I think there have been two, two problems. And why it's taken so long, I think it's because we've had to get both problems right. The first is the innate immune response can really only be manipulated by the pig. You have to have a pig that is protected against the human immediate innate immune response. Mm. And that's been complicated. Uh, in the early days, it took months and months to make a new pig. Now, <clears throat> now with CRISPR and so on, it's much quicker uh, and cheaper and so on. But it took a long time. And uh, the second thing is the adaptive immune response, where you develop new antibodies against the pig, unless you have good immune expression. And uh, you'll remember this, that the uh, that the conventional immunosuppressive therapy wasn't very successful in xenotransplantation. And we, 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 we were the first to use co-stimulation blockade in the form of anti-CD154, anti-CD40 ligand, um, back in 2000. Um, and uh, this made a huge difference. But you'll probably remember those early anti-CD154 drugs, uh, agents, monoclonals, were actually thrombogenic and they were pulled and we couldn't use them anymore. And so it took some time for people to start using anti-CD40 and now we're using modified anti-CD154s which seem very effective and do not are not thrombogenic. So it's taken a long time to get everything in order and I think we're now very close to be able to do proper clinical trials um, uh, in the next uh, couple of years. Yeah, I think um, uh, obviously you have alluded to that already, but how do you feel about the current progress in xenotransplantation, especially with regards to the real first clinical xenotransplants that have happened? Um, there is, of course, a couple of uh, different uh, clinical um, uh, applications of xenotransplantation, but can you, can you reflect on that? Yes, I, I think we're ready for clinical trials with both the kidney and the heart. I've not been a great fan of the, um, of the studies in brain dead subjects. Uh, when I was in Pittsburgh uh, some years ago, or probably 15, 16, 17 years ago, Tom Stasel was thinking of doing some transplants, some pig organ transplants in, in uh, brain dead human subjects. And at that time, with the worry about porcine endogenous retroviruses and so on and so on, it became too complicated to try to do it. Um, but I wasn't a fan on it then anyway, because I think we really have all the answers that we need from both in vitro studies and in in vivo studies in the pig to monkey or baboon model. We know that hyperacute rejection is not going to happen these days with the pigs we have available now. Uh, what we now need to know is what's going to happen in six months time. Is the, is the graph going to be lost? Uh, are we going to be able to keep it going? For example, in all of the orthotopic heart transplants that have been carried out, and uh, one of my colleagues in, um, in UAB uh, did some of these, uh, and the Maryland people, of course, have done them, and a group in Munich have been doing them, uh, the longest survival to date has been less than nine months, and they've died of rejection. So if in the human, in, if in the non-human primate model, you can only get out about nine months. Now, there are some reasons why it's more difficult in the non-human primate than in the human, but it seems to me that we're probably going to have to use these organs initially as bridges to, tra to allo transplantation. Maybe there'll be a, an adult patient who is not suitable for an assist device, has perhaps a restrictive cardiomyopathy or something, and the only way he's going to survive till he gets a human organ is to be bridged with a pig heart. And particularly, and my colleagues in UAB in Alabama were particularly keen on this, uh, babies born with complex congenital heart disease, particularly like uh, single ventricle pathology, uh, they do extremely well if you give them a heart transplant. The 25-year the survival is about 60%. I mean, it's really fantastically good. Uh, but they, of course, the problem is they don't get a heart for several months, and they either die or they have to have some palliative surgery. And we thought that if you could put a pig organ in, a uh, pig heart in, in the first week of life and keep them going for six months till they get a human one, they would do extremely well. Um, and I, I, I firmly believe that will be a, a major step forward. Um, 
So there are approaches where you can use them at these, these peak organs as a bridge, I think very ethically. And uh, it also doesn't commit the patient, the little patient for a lifetime with a pig organ, you're just bridging him till he gets a, 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 a human organ. So I think this is the way we, we would go. With the, the kidney, of course, it's slightly different. You've got, you can fall back on dialysis. Um, and I think that's probably more ethical because you can do a big kidney in, and if it fails or you have to take it out because the patient's got an infection you can't overcome, uh, you can fall back on dialysis in the majority of cases anyway. So uh, I think the selection of the patient is going to be very important. Yeah, I would like to come back to that a bit later as well. But how did you how did you feel sort of when the first real Xeno heart transplant was done? I mean, this must have been enormous uh, thing for you, having worked yes, for decades. I mean, it was it was a bit of a mixture because I would have liked to be involved in it personally myself. Uh, but on the other hand, I was very pleased that somebody had done it. Uh, the Maryland team are on the same. I, NIH grant as, as I am, and we've been looking at the kidneys, they've been looking at the hearts. And Bartley Griffith had contacted me a few weeks before he did it to uh, discuss some points. I didn't know the patient he was going to do it with, but uh, he, he was discussing it with me. Um, and so I was very pleased that somebody had taken the, the step forward to do it, because I think we really are, we should be doing clinical trials now. The only criticism I have, or not a criticism, but the only compliment I have is that, unfortunately, their patient was really, I think, too debilitated to really get through it all. And um, I've just reviewed their publication and, and written with some colleagues a commentary on it. And it's very clear that patient just never thrived afterwards. He, he uh, just didn't have, I think he was just too debilitated at the time. And they thought that the new heart would give him a new lease of life. And, he, and even though the heart worked very well for about six or seven weeks, um, he never re, never re, regained his strength and energy. So, uh, but I'm very pleased because uh, as you probably know, in the peak to non-human primate model, these triple knockout pigs, which do not express the three key uh, xenoantigens against which we have antibodies. Um, in non-human primates, all non-human primates do express, uh, have, have antibodies against these pigs, whereas a, a large number of humans, like at least a third of them, do not have antibodies against them. So we are still in the lab, we're still doing transplants in sensitized recipients. They're all sensitized against the pig, and that makes it pretty difficult. And we don't see a way around that, to be honest. And therefore, I think we're at a stage now we should, we should we should plan a small clinical trial. I think we'll learn much more from that than we will if we continue in the, in the lab. Um, the lab will still be important. We want to try different new, new pigs coming through or new immunosuppressive agents are coming through and so on. But I think it's going to be much simpler and easier. Uh, and the patients will do much better than the, the non-human primates will do. Uh, not only for that reason, but for a lot of other reasons. But I think we're at that stage now that we have to carefully select a small number of patients and do a clinical trial and see where we, where we get to it. We know what drugs we need to use for immunosuppression. We know what pigs we want to use. There are now clean pig facilities either available or being built. And so I think we're at that stage. My, what I would say is, and I've suggested this two or three years ago, I think I would only, the clinical first clinical trial, I think would be perhaps only four patients uh, you do one, if three months later he or she is doing well, you do the second one. If three months later they, they're, they're doing well as well, you do the third one and so on. If there's a big complication that you didn't expect or so on, then you stop the trial while you sort that out. And I think that would be, it's cautious, but I think you'd learn a great deal from a, a simple trial like that. And if at the end of the year, all four patients are doing well, then you expand the trial and do it in you know, larger numbers. So they are talking would, heart transplant, xeno heart know, transplant. Heart, heart or kidney, yeah. yeah. For, unfortunately, with, with the liver and the lung, there seem to be more complex immunological inflammatory problems that we're not ready to do a clinical trial as yet. Although we could use the pig liver, as has been done in the past, uh, as an ex vivo uh, perfusion system to, um, to improve the status of patients who are in acute uh, liver failure who might recover over the next few days if we could support them for a period of time, perhaps put a, to put them 
join them up to a pig liver every day for a week or two, and then they might recover. Also, I think um, we witnessed a, a short um, uh, revival of xenotransplantation in the early 2000s when the GALP T knockout pigs became available. But then I think more and more programs on xenotransplant research were shut down, the funding dried up because people didn't believe it would ever reach uh, this moment of a, of a clinical breakthrough, so to speak. And I remember many slides that you always used, uh, xenotransplantation is always around the corner, but it may be a very long corner. Um, but how, how difficult was that to, to survive in a world where there was hardly any funding in a very difficult to maintain uh, laboratory research program? Yeah, well, we were fortunate that the NIH in about 2005 decided they would have a program to support, specifically to support Zedo transplantation. And they would only fund groups who were doing pig to baboon or pig to monkey transplants. It wasn't in mice or anything like that. So this was very helpful to us. So we, we were able to get a grant initially and we've had it um, repeat, re, 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 uh, re-given to us over the last several years. I think we're the only group that's had that funding that whole time. Um, so that was a huge help, but I, I think we might well have gone under if, if we hadn't had that support. Um, and then fortunately, one or two of the companies such as Revivicor, um, although very uh, tenuous, uh, managed to keep getting funding during that period of time. Um, uh, when I joined Pittsburgh after you and I had worked together in Boston, uh, it was because the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, which is the company that owns the hospitals in that area, they own about 20 hospitals, they had purchased Revivicor um, because they saw the future of uh, transplantation in xeno transplantation. Unfortunately, they didn't have the patience to keep, keep owning it, and, and it was going to go under until Martin Rothblatt, who owns United Therapeutics, fortunately bought it out. Um, nearly 10 years ago now, I suppose. And um, so there's always been somebody who had the vision to, to fund one, one or more of these companies. And I think now, uh, particularly after the heart transplant, that uh, funding will be perhaps a little easier because I think more and more people now realize it is gonna happen and it's gonna be the future of transplantation. But there were difficult times, you're absolutely right. But I was always convinced it was gonna work. And so, um, I didn't think it was going to take us quite this long, um, but I was always convinced that it was going to work and it will be the future of trans transplantation. And I suspect in 20 years time, you'll go to a transplant Congress and virtually all of the talks will be about xenotransplantation transplantation because it'll take over because of the advantages of this. I think this is particularly interested, interesting for really young colleagues in the field that need this sort of inspiration and also the, the wise words you, you spoke. If you believe that this is the right thing and you need to keep going, uh, I think uh, one of the quotes you quite often used was the three ways to success are perseverance, perseverance, and perseverance. This was Roosevelt. Um, but you have proven right in that respect. So... I think this is very, very important for young colleagues. When you believe this is the right thing, you, you can even devote your whole career to that um, and, and, and keep going. Yeah, I think, I think you, you've got to be pretty convinced and there's got to be good reasons that you're convinced because quite a few people I noticed in the field, when stem cells started to raise their heads, they left the field and went into stem cell research. Um, I don't think they've got any moving any quicker than we have. But I remember talking to Norman Shumway, the great pioneer of heart transplantation some years ago. And I said to him, did he ever think of giving up when things were not going well, but particularly when he started the clinical program, when the results were pretty mixed. And he said there was always just enough success that you felt that if we stick at it, it's going to be successful uh, and it'll, it'll become routine. And I think you have to have that belief in what you know, the field you're investigating to feel that it, it will become, as long as we're going to hang in there and keep, keep moving forward as, as well as we can. And how would you advise um, people that are just entering the field? How, how do you deal with criticism when people say, ah, oh, you're crazy, that you, you really want to continue doing research in this area? 
um, why don't you just give up? Uh, it's going to lead nowhere. And you get criticized. Um, and I'm sure you have been criticized in your career uh, and, and celebrated, obviously, many times. But what would your advice be? I think now I would strongly push people to get into Xenia transportation because I don't see any reason now why it won't be very successful. I mean, we have all the technology now. Uh, we have the new drugs which are coming through. We have better and better peaks and so on. I think when you got involved in it 20 years ago, that was quite a risk for you because it could have all collapsed around you and you would have, you would have spent some very good research years, but in a field that perhaps wasn't going to develop. But I think now it's, it's, it's safe to, think, it, to, to, to feel it's definitely going to be successful. And I think anybody who knows anything about Xeno transportation in the next few years is going to be in demand because every major center will now say, we need to start this Xeno transportation. And who, who knows about it? Who can we recruit to come and help us get off the ground? So particularly any uh, transplant uh, surgeons or nephrologists and so on, if they know something about Xeno transportation, I think it's going to be a, a, a big career, good career, career move for them. Um, I, I don't think the criticism worried me very much because I always felt it was going to work. And uh, uh, even back in 1985, when we started looking at it, I still thought this is, this is going to work if we uh, now, I didn't know how it was going to work. And I think the genetic engineering proved a huge step forward for us. Um, and the, the, the development of some of these new immunosuppressive agents, of course, which one didn't anticipate at the time um, has been very helpful. But I still felt that eventually it'll be successful. And so therefore stick with it. Um, if you chop and change and go from one research area to another, it's very difficult to, to, to keep up uh, or to learn again the new field. So I think you should choose something that looks likely to happen, that looks likely to become successful and stick with it rather than jump from one field to another. Very clear message. Um, you alluded, of course, um, um, about the crucial steps required for wider clinical application of xenotransplantation and patient selection. Um, what are the remaining hurdles, in your view, are that, let's say, for, for kidneys and for heart transplants? Well, um, we still have a little bit to do. For example, we are not 100% sure which pig we should use. We have pigs here with uh, 9, 10, 12, I think up to 15 genetic manipulations. They're probably not all necessary, and you have to decide which ones are essential and which ones are not. Uh, we wrote a paper in 2019 where we, we selected nine genetic manipulations, which I thought covered pretty well everything. And I think they would be fine. And you might even manage with less than those. Um, but I think that, that, that they're, they're, they're the optimum at the moment. Um, it's obviously probably easier to make a pig with fewer genetic manipulations or if you want good expression and so on. So maybe a few fewer would be, would be adequate. Um, so we, we need to be sure which pig, for example, there are some uh, experts in the field who feel that just a triple knockout pig without any extra human protective transgenes in them would be sufficient. I don't think that's the case. I think it's better to have the backup of the human complement regulatory proteins and so on, because I think it just covers, if it's not an antibody mediated problem, like uh, an alternative uh, complement pathway, it will, it will give you an extra extra uh, um, extra support um, and then we have to be sure what immunosuppressive regimen we're going to use um, we all feel that these anti-cd 154 monoclonal antibodies are going to be essential they're much better results than if you use either uh, belatacept or conventional immunosuppression but we all again there's some thought what do we need to combine it with do we need some conventional immunosuppression as well We've been using rapamycin for the last several years with pretty good results, but there are complications with, uh, uh, with rapamycin. And my nephrology colleagues here tell me that a lot of patients can't tolerate them. So we, we're thinking of switching to something else. Other people have been using, we, we did originally use Mofetil. Um, not many people use tacrolimus, but there may be some advantage in that. Uh, and we've used steroids, but I'm not sure steroids are essential. I think we can manage well. We had an experience just before I left Alabama. We had a baboon that was two months out from uh, with a kidney transplant, 
and uh, we were going to be leaving in two months time so we stopped all the drugs except the anti-cd40 monoclonal and two months later the baboon was fine the creatinine was normal and it seemed to me that we didn't need all these additional drugs now since i came here we've tried the same thing with less success so we're still trying to sort out whether we do that or not so i think there's some fine tuning of both the pig and the uh, and the immunosuppressive regimen and what we certainly need is more designated pathogen free pig facilities where you can power breed and house pigs under extreme uh, clean conditions so that uh, they're not carrying um, uh, microorganisms with them now you know that that was a, a failure with the um, with the uh, Maryland group there had been a facility built in in Alabama just outside Birmingham where I was um, which Revivicord built and um, as far as we knew they were all pathogen free pigs but with something like CMV they can easily get you know positive again and unfortunately that's what happened with this uh, first um, transplant so you, you're going to have to be very careful with a lot of sensitive tests and so on so um, we need more of those facilities around the country probably so also a clinical clinically realistic immunosuppressive regime uh, i think we used to probably over immunosuppress as you said uh, our baboons for sure and perhaps the first patient was also over immunosuppressed in combination with uh, a not completely SPF uh, source pig, um, which, which may have been uh, uh, causing the troubles. I think um, the I think this first patient was must have been a very difficult patient for them to manage because he had uh, he he was Im immunosuppressed himself. He had low platelet yeah. count, low white count, no very low plasma proteins and so on. I think they found it must have found it very difficult to know what level of immunosuppression they need to give him. They didn't want to obviously kill him with immunosuppression, uh, particularly when they found that he had pig CMV. Um, so it must have been very difficult to, to, to manage him. There, therefore, I feel strongly that if we're going to do a trial like this, we need to choose patients who've got a really realistic chance of surviving the procedure and, the, uh, and, and what is required. So they need to be pretty healthy people. Our feeling was that... Um, uh, patients, for example, who, who are on dialysis, there are several patients, many patients who may be on dialysis in this country for eight or nine or 10 years before they get an organ, a donor kidney. Um, and uh, if you look at the, the, the data, uh, within five years, almost half of those patients will be either dead or taken off the waiting list yep. because they now <laughs> develop other problems or comorbidities. If you tell patients up front, now, the, the, if you take a patient, say, at the age of 60, he may be a good candidate at that time, physiologically in good shape, but, but five or 10 years later, he may not be a suitable patient. And if you tell patients like that, look, you're going to go on the waiting list, you may have to wait some time, they always think, well, that's fine, I can be patient. But if you say to them, there's a 50% chance you won't be on that waiting list in five years, uh, it's actually about 45%, but still that you're gonna be taken off or you may be dead by then. Um, they may be much more interested in having a pig organ transplant uh, to, 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 to bridge them part of that way anyway. Uh, for example, I think patients, you know much more than I would, patients are much feel, feel much better and they're much happier if they don't go to the dialysis clinic three times a week. And so their social life is better and they feel physiologically better. And even if you could put a, a pig kidney in and it only survived one or two or three years, it would be well worth it for, for that patient. The quality of life would improve. And in the meantime, they're still on the waiting list for that human organ. Andrew Adams at Minneapolis, he's got one monkey now who's more than three years with the same kidney trans pig kidney transplant. So we know that the kidney is going to work well. We know it's going to function. It's going to maintain life. Um, and if we can do that in a patient... Um, the, the patient would be much better off to have a big kidney transplant than, um, than to be on dialysis three times a week. So I think they're a very good case for, for, for moving into the clinic and just seeing, can we, can we prove that this is going to be effective? Oh, especially this may be relevant for patients who are highly sensitized and have a, a small chance of getting a human kidney transplant or a human heart transplant. 
Um, we did some work uh, in the early days to see if those uh, HLA sensitized patients would also be uh, cross reactive to um, uh, to pick uh, SLA or to to pick antigens in general. Is, is that still true? That actually there was no or hardly any cross reactivity. Well, uh, Joe Tech has done a lot of very nice work on this, and there are some patients who uh, there is cross reactivity, but not very many. Uh, it's it's in the less than ten percent. I think it's about five or six percent. Uh, and he's also come up with some su su suggested methods of genetically engineering the pig to, pro to protect them from those antibodies. You, you change some amino acids in the pig and then they're no longer uh, sensitized. Um, so it doesn't affect too many people. So if you can be sure by your preclinical test or pre-transplant testing that the patient may have anti-HLA antibodies, but they don't cross react with pig antigens, <clears throat> then those patients certainly will benefit enormously from uh, xenotransplantation. And the other important thing about that is uh, that if you get sensitized to the pig organ, it does not, it's not detrimental to you having a subsequent allotransplant. Um, obviously, you then you would have to find one that you're not sensitized to get from the HLA perspective, but it doesn't it, it for, for, for various reasons, it's not detrimental to you. To. So this is particularly, we think, important with these babies who, get, who might have a, a pig heart as a, as a bridge. Yeah. Um, if, if they got sensitized to the pig, it won't stop them having a human uh, allo transplant within a, a few months later. So I think they, those patients will be... Now, in the first clinical trial, I would probably avoid patients who are highly HLA sensitized, just to be quite sure that you're not taking on a problem and there a third of the third of the patient on the waiting list in the United States are, are not HLA sensitized so you have lots of patients to choose from and I think just to make it safe the first few I would do would not be HLA sensitized but once you've proven that they're doing well then the HLA sensitized patient will benefit enormously yes. Now, this is, um, I think you've written at least uh, a couple of papers on this topic uh, also one of my personal interests is informed consent and I think in the press, we have seen uh, a few words on that from the Maryland team, how they consented the particular patient and their family for, for the first clinical xenotransplants. In the future, what are issues that we should take into account beyond the normal things? You are a clinician, of course, for have been working clinically for many, many years. Um, what are the issues that make this a special informed consent? I think the most important thing, and I've just written a informed consent for us here um, and uh, we reviewed the topic recently uh, in another publication. Um, I think the important difference is that these patients uh, theoretically at least will not be allowed to drop out of this trial. Um, normally the patient can opt out of the trial at any time if they wish to uh, but you will have to get these patients to sign on the dotted line that they understand that they can't drop out even if the graft is rejected like a kidney and you take it out and they go back on dialysis because the FDA and others will want you to follow those patients almost for life to be sure that they didn't get a pig microorganism that causing trouble later on in the form of a cancer or something or other. And so that will be often difficult for the patient to accept I think. Um, and you would have to choose patients who are very compliant with medical advice. And that's another thing that worried me about the first heart transplant in Maryland. The patient was, one of the reasons he was going to have it was because he was not compliant enough to have an allo transplant. Uh, and, uh, or, and that made me wonder if he was the right patient. And so I think you have to have patients who are known to be compliant and sensible and uh, understand that even if the graph fails, they've got to keep showing up at least yearly or something to get checked to be sure that they have not picked up some funny infection from the peak. I think it's very unlikely, but I think for the first few years, we will be monitoring patients for the rest of their lives. Yeah, very um, sensible and wise words, I would say. Um, the last thing for, for this uh, Xenotalk uh, interview, um, I think in the past, you have definitely already thought about this uh, many times, is how do we organize our healthcare system 
uh, systems um, for clinical, for wide application of clinical xenotransplantation in terms of donor, well, sores, pigs, um, in terms of uh, how healthcare is organized with increasing number of transplants in daytime because we don't have to uh, do retrievals in the middle of the night necessarily. It can be all elective uh, care. How, how would you advise people in the world to organize this? And would this be widely available to everyone? Well, obviously the financial side is very important. And as you know, that organ transplantation is not available to everybody worldwide. It's mainly really in the affluent countries or affluent people going to affluent countries to get the transplants or, or, or so on. So financial will be important because it will be expensive. I don't think it will be much more expensive than an allo transplant because the money you will save on uh, the organ sharing networks and so on, um, the money you will save on taking private jets to pick up organs, the money you will save on having patients in ICU for a long period of time, et cetera, et cetera, will be a saving. But obviously the companies that have put, put millions into making these pigs uh, will expect to get some uh, profit eventually. So it'll be expensive like most uh, um, tertiary care is, is today. Um, so I think uh, if, you if you exclude the financial side of it though, I think it's going to be like any other device that you will phone the company and you'll order the device or you'll order the pig and it will be delivered. And in the case of the pig, you'll say, I want it at nine o'clock on Monday morning and it'll show up at your place at nine o'clock on Monday morning, you'll do the transplant. It'll be just like a pig um, a valve that we've been putting in for many years. It'll become a commodity that you will just order as you need them and you'll pay for them. There will be no organ sharing networks. There'll be no UNOS in the United States or Euro transplant and so on and so on, because it will just be purchased as you need it, which will simplify things a great deal as long as you can afford to, to buy it. And that'll be the stumbling block. Um, so I don't think it'll be a matter of a fair distribution. It'll be whether your healthcare insurance will cover the costs or not. If you can show that it's cheaper than dialysis, um, then they will do it. If you can show them it's cheaper than having a patient in heart failure coming in out of hospital every few months, then they'll, they'll pay for it. If it's not cheaper, they'll probably um, be resistant. But I think it'll become just another uh, drug or another device that we, if we can afford it, we will we will order and, and put in. This uh, may sound like music to the ears of uh, of many transplant surgeons who are very worried about the future and about sustainability of services with so many uh, after hours and in the middle of the night operating, uh, flying around to various places to retrieve organs from deceased donors. Um, and then transplanting all night to, to put them into the recipients. Um, so this, this may actually transform transplantation towards a more sustainable model as well, is what you're saying. And I think with the new work that's coming through with um, uh, perfusion devices, perfusion machines, uh, you won't need to have too many pig centers or pig facilities to be able to ship your organs around uh, fairly satisfactorily and safely. Uh, on a machine to distant uh, hospitals. Um, so I think um, all those things will come together and eventually it'll become very routine and probably get less expensive as we, as we go along. But uh, you could never, never be sure about that, of course. Well, thank you so very much, David. I, I definitely uh, would like to say let's catch up sooner than 20 years after uh, our, our collaborative work in Boston and let's hope that uh, the Xeno talks will continue and that we can catch up uh, in a couple of years uh, or even sooner about more clinical Xeno transplant applications and, uh, and your experience. A great pleasure. In 20 years time, I probably won't be here, but you'll be here. And um, uh, I, I agree with you. It shouldn't be, be 20 years. It should be much sooner than that. Um, I have very happy memories of working with you in, uh, in Boston. So we must... Uh, we must keep in touch a little more frequently. Thank you very much for inviting me, by the way. Thank you so much uh, for this interview. And uh, hopefully the whole ESOT community uh, will keep uh, following all the, the, the fascinating developments in xenotransplantation. And people might actually pick up a career in xenotransplantation based on, on this interview with you. So um, 
thank you everyone for for listening and thank you so much david and good luck with all your uh, enterprises and uh, an exciting research thank you very much <laughs>